Hello, Debbie Dashinger here. Go to my website, DebraDashinger.com. That's Deborah, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. And you'll find so much amazing stuff there for you to be inspired and motivated for it. So <laughs> there is also my best-selling book, which is Dare to Dream, This Life Counts, Doesn't It? That's the picture. <laughs> so... <laughs> Listen, y'all, I have to check in. So I haven't done, I haven't done a, a video in a long time. So here I am doing a video with you. <laughs> and one of the things that I teach, because I'm doing a lot of teaching right now, and I think I'm going to be doing some teleseries. So for those of you out there who really want to bone up on your dreams, well, you know what I'm really saying. If you want to achieve your dreams and your goals and you want to sign up for a tele-series, go to my website. Just send an email. Contact me right on the DebraDashinger.com site and you can let me know. We can add you to a list for any information that's going to be coming out soon about when, where, how. Um, and, and you got a head start, so don't worry. So what I want to tell you that I one of the things that I'm disseminating because I, every, as I learn, I teach, as I learn, I teach, is that we set goals, we achieve them. And there's a whole process to that, of course. But one of the things that happens is once you achieve a goal is that the next thing is you set a higher goal. You don't rest, as they say in the Bible, you don't rest your laurels. So <laughs> you're not going to rest your laurels. And you're going to always find something that's a higher purpose for you to shift into. So that means you're always kind of in that like awkward, growing, becoming stage. You know, and here's the truth. I say that awkward, growing, becoming. Some people are fearless, you know. They're kind of like the people who ski, ski crazy places and jump off things and real thrill seekers about dreams. And there's, there are those people. I've met them. This doesn't scare them. There's no fear at all. It's just pure exhilaration. Oh, my God, I want a blood transfusion with you. That's not my story. It's not most people that I come in contact with. For most of us, there are, are feelings that come with it. So that's me right now because I'm expanding and growing, and I'm moving into really new areas for myself, and I'm showing up. That's all I know. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to make it right. I don't have to take those feelings and put them anywhere. They could just exist, and I can still move forward and do it anyway. They just don't have to get the better of me. That's the thing. If they paralyze me, then we in trouble. You get what I'm saying? <sighs> so, that's really my important massage. And why do we need goals? We need goals because they give us direction in life. Otherwise, we just meander. But personally, career-wise, strategically, relationally, materially, contribution-wise, having goals gives us a place to go from here to there. It also gives us a purpose in life, a reason to get up and really have the mmm that we do because we know we're going after something and things are happening and it's pretty darn exciting. Goals definitely, they get that. It's like we're a race car and you get that drive, you get that passion going, and it is so cool to be inside yourself when you're operating like that. And if you're not having goals, it's sort of like being a ship when you're out at sea and you kind of have no map. I want to go here, but I don't really quite know how I'm going to get there. It's like, well, who knows where you'll end up, or maybe you'll run into ground or cliffs or something. We don't want that in life. We want you to really get where it is your heart desires for you to be. So have a map. Have a goal. So, of course, first you have to dream, then you have to decide. You just have to decide to step into things. You have to write them down on paper. You have to take action. You have to let it go. Always let it go. Do and then let go. Do and then let go. And then you have to heal whatever's in your way because that's part of the wonderful journey. Things do get healed. They do get dealt with. And then... Just so you know, too, that healing thing, it really, we really can be quite challenged when we pursue a dream. And that is okay. That's the time to not go, whoa, this feels really challenging and uncomfortable. I'm backing off. Instead, that's the time to go, that's very interesting that this experience challenges me. And so I'm stepping into it rather than away from it. That's the secret sauce right there. If you can do that, woo, you could push your limits. You really could. 
you can really tell yourself, I could achieve anything. I can be successful. I am successful. I am going to reach my true potential. I'm going to constantly push myself and see what that feels like because I just think I'm that big and I'm really expanded, huge, wonderful, awesome. So I'll tell you a little story. There was somebody by the name of Major James Nesmith, and he always dreamt of improving his golf game. And he was okay. I mean, he just sort of shot in the mid-90s. You know, he was okay. He was very, he was a very usual golfer, actually. But he actually achieved his dream, but not in the way you would think he did. He actually achieved his dream when he completely quit his game. Hmm, you might think. That's pretty weird because anyone who plays golf and says he never touched a club, that's impossible, man. You gotta keep going. It's true. Major John Nesmith didn't set a foot, not neither of his feet anyway, in a fairway in those seven years. And he improved his game because he created amazing technique and that amazing technique had him shoot an astonishing 74. So let me fill in the blanks now what happened. Major John Nesmith was a casualty of war, meaning that he was held in a prisoner of war camp for seven years. It's unthinkable what he went through. And because he didn't know how to go through every day because his brain, his emotions, everything was so tried physically, it was so horrendous, his conditions. But every day, he laid in his tiny little barely human cell, and what he would do is he would picture himself on the golf course, and he would play a full 18 holes if it took him four hours, five hours. Sometimes he'd see himself playing in the rain. Sometimes it was in the wind. Sometimes it was in the heat. Sometimes it was good condition. He put trees on the fairway. He put bunkers. He put water hazards. He put all sorts of conditions and he played in his mind the toughest courses every day. What he did was when he, when he hit his, you know, I, you know, I golf, right? So when he hit his driver, he saw, I'm sorry, I'm at a desk and I'm probably going to hit my tee and everything else. So I'm going to be very careful. But when he hit his driver, what he did is he saw it go beautifully, perfectly, bam, right in the middle of the fairway. When he saw himself hit again or chip, let's say, depending on how, how much yardage he was going to give himself, he saw himself perfectly land. When he saw himself putt, it went right into the cup. So he played this every single day for seven years. When he was released from the prisoner of war camp and he came back home, one of the first things he did when he could was he went to a golf course, took out his old clubs, and there he was in the golf course. And he shot 74. Astonishing indeed. But why I tell you that story is because A, it's the power of our minds. B, it's what we can accomplish. C, during difficult times, what did he do? Did he crumble? No. He found a way to survive and thrive and stay alive. And he did it with something that he had passion and a dream about so he could achieve his dream even under those circumstances. And also, it teaches you the power of your imagination. I did that my second year. I've done two marathons. And when I went to do my second marathon, and here I am talking about higher goals, loftier goals, pushing yourself, I realized I don't know about doing a second marathon because I actually, I didn't really have much about doing another marathon. I felt like I did that. I was good with that. Some people like to keep going. So I thought, well, if you are going to do a second marathon, Debbie, then you have got to come up with another goal, something that you have to challenge yourself with. It has to be a challenge that makes you really work to move forward. I decided my goal was to shave off 30 minutes from 26.2 mile marathon. Now, for those of you who do marathons, you know what I'm saying. That is a huge, tall order. Oh my. But still, big, yummy, juicy goal. Challenge yourself. What I did, of course, I did all the training for eight months, all the physical training. That was done. I always do the preparation. Always do the preparation for your dream. Be prepared. 
and then two weeks before the marathon, because that's when you really start winding down and pulling back and you're not taxing your body quite as much, you're resting more, what I would do is every single day, I would take one five-minute period, one five-minute period, and I would, in my imagination, just like the story I told you, I would see myself finishing the race. As I finished the race, I would look up and see the clock. I would see the time I preferred to see. Then I would go through the finish line and I'd feel all those amazing emotions that one feels when one accomplishes one goal and f finishes a marathon. Come the day of the actual race, after two weeks of having done that, the day of the actual race, and everything's going fantastic, as I knew it would. I'm doing great. Mile 18 comes, mile 19, mile 20, and I'm starting to realize as I'm in the 20 miles-ish, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. I might meet my goal. And then I thought, well, that's bittersweet. I'm so psyched that I'm going to meet my goal. But what's bittersweet is I didn't tell anyone I had this goal, so nobody knows to try to meet me earlier than expected at the goal line, at the finish line. Oh, my God. And when you're doing something that big for that many hours and you've been training for that long, man, do you want somebody there to witness your moment. Of course, you're there and there's crowds there of strangers. But the point is, you really want someone there who can see it. And so I was coming around the finish line corner and out of this huge mass of people and strangers, I heard someone screaming my name over and over again. <sighs> And I looked and I saw her. I get very emotional. <laughs> it's very emotional. And it's still, and this isn't recent, but it's amazing how you can go back to joy, joyful, joyful creations we've had and moments in our lives. It was my mom. Somehow she had intuited that I was going to be there. I don't know how and bless her for that because that meant everything. So I hear her screaming there and then, oh, you know, a whole new energy came into me. And there I am finishing the 26.1, 26.2. And just like in my imaginations, I look up and I see the time and I go through the finish line. And as I go through and I stop because they have to take the chip off of your shoe, I burst into tears. They're running over thinking, I'm injured. And I'm <gasps> trying to explain, of course, your breath work too when you're breathing that hard running constitutes some of that energy coming out. So I am crying and I said, no, no, it's tears of joy. Because what had happened was when I looked up to see my time, I didn't see 30 minutes shaved off. I cut one hour, 60 minutes, one hour off of my marathon time. The power of the imagination indeed. And that's the only thing that I did different. So what are you going to do today? How are you going to create a loftier, bigger goal for yourself? What do you dare to dream? And what dream do you dare to make your reality? This is Debbie Dashinger. Go to DebraDashinger.com. I love to have you join me there. And go sign up for the newsletters so you can hear, if you like this, if this is inspiring, whoa, listen to the radio show, Off the Hook, syndicated, award-winning, really worth it. I adore you. Have a great day.